Thank you very much. Uh, it's really a delight to be here, and I'd uh, like to thank the Sonic Axe Foundation for inviting me. Um, I'm always really uh, delighted to talk about birds, and uh, I'd like to sort of share my own fascination with them. I have spent most of my um, career in geophysics, but lately, toward the end of my career, I've moved toward the interface between geophysics and biology. And uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about, and it, it's pretty fascinating. But what I'd like to start with is to introduce you to one of the real superstars of the avian world, and that is the bar-tailed godwit. And the bar-tailed godwit migrates 29,000 kilometers a year. It starts, whoops, it starts in Alaska and migrates to New Zealand, then up to the Yellow Sea, and then back to Alaska, 29,000 kilometers. Um, it has a bit of help with the winds on the second two legs. You can see that the westerlies of the, I'm sorry, the easterlies of the trades are sort of helping it in this direction. And it's, sorry, big thumb. And uh, it's actually using the westerlies on the way back from the Yellow Sea to Alaska. Um, but anyhow, what I want to talk about is the, the first leg. And this is, this is truly amazing. And it wasn't known, uh, it, knew, it was known that it flew from Alaska to New Zealand, but it wasn't known how long it took to get there. And this has only been recently found within the last couple of years when they put a GPS on this animal and they found that it goes nonstop. So five days, full bore flying from Alaska to uh, New Zealand in a straight line. And the other thing that's, that's truly remarkable is that it does not leave Alaska until the, the wind conditions, the weather conditions along the entire route are optimal. Okay? So it, sitting in Alaska, knows what the wind conditions are in the, summer hem summer, uh, the southern hemisphere. It's just truly amazing. Um, and you can see that it flies in a straight line. Each of those little dots is one of the GPS uh, locations. Um, it's just fantastic. And this thing is only 40, 40 uh, centimeters long uh, with a wingspan of about 80 centimeters. It's just incredible. Okay, I'd like to introduce you to another avian genius, and uh, that is the homing pigeon. There are probably a few hanging out around on the pavement outside also known as the carrier pigeon, the Postauf and the Brieftaube. Um, but uh, I want to talk about this because this is the animal that is selected by biologists to study. And so there is a huge amount of information on this animal. And the reasons are that, is that it's easy to keep and handle. It navigates on demand. You don't have to wait around six months for this animal to decide it feels like migrating. You can just take it away from its loft, it'll fly back. Um, it has an absolutely remarkable navigational ability. It can re return to its loft from hundreds of kilometers away. You can take it someplace it's never been before, release it, it will fly back to its loft. And it's uh, previously the state of art airmail, brief tauba, post tauif, but um, it's presently the subject of a worldwide sport. People race pigeons all over the world. You can spend $100,000 on one if you want. And uh, so, the other thing is it has, because of all this study, it has amazing um, sensory capabilities. It can uh, detect the direction and intensity of the geomagnetic field. Uh, it can see polarized and ultraviolet light. It can detect small changes in atmospheric pressure less than a millibar, and remember that atmospheric pressure is one bar, so that's less than a thousandth of atmospheric pressure, and it can hear low-frequency inf infrasound down to 0 0.05 hertz. 0 0.05, 0 0.05, that's another just absolutely incredible. Um, some people think that it uses its uh, olfactory ability in navigating, but it really only has average-sized olfactory bulbs, so it just has an average sense of smell. Obviously, I, I don't think it uses smell to navigate. Um, so what is the, the basic theory, the basic idea of how it uh, navigates? Um, it uses 
a map and compass, very similar to what we do. If we're going to navigate somewhere, the first thing we do is basically look at a map. Where are we now? Where do we want to go? Where is that place we want to go in terms of direction? Say to the northwest, we pull out our compass, look at the compass, oh, that's, that direction is northwest, and we go that way. Pigeons do the same thing. And their compasses are pretty well known. Oops. They use the uh, sun azimuth. They have a biological clock, so it's time compensated. So they can look at the direction of the sun and they'll immediately know which way is north, south, east, and west. They can also use the geomagnetic field. We do that as well, but they use the inclination. We use the declination, which is in the horizontal plane. They use the inclination in the vertical plane. Why? It works in both hemispheres, it's great. Um, night migrating birds use the rotation of the stars. It's uh, the home... The homing pigeons uh, only have sun and geomagnetic compasses. <clears throat> so those are the compasses. But well, what the heck is the map? And that's been the problem. Um, that's been the really enduring mystery in this whole thing. How do they know where they are relative to where they're going? Um, it's been suggested that they use the geomagnetic field. They use gradients of the geomagnetic field. There is a gradient from the equator to the pole. There's an ingra that gradient in the change in inclination and also in the intensity of the geomagnetic field. But there's no east-west gradient, so how do they get longitude? And uh, um, human navigators had the same problem. Uh, other people, other biologists have suggested they use olfactory cues. Um, I just don't think this works. Um, how can you use a passively moved um, odor in the atmosphere in an unstable and turbulent atmosphere? It, it, it just doesn't make sense. They have reasons for believing this. They do have evidence that supports this idea, but I, I don't have time to go into why. All I'm trying to say here is that both the current theories, this button, um, both the current theories of geomagnetic field and olfactory cues have fundamental flaws. So I just don't think they work. Um, you could also think they might use sight, but uh, here if you take a pigeon and put frosted lenses on it so that it, it can see its compass, its, its sun compass, but it can't see landmarks and let it go about 30 kilometers from uh, its loft, it will be able to fly up and circle around its loft but it needs sight to see the loft for its final approach. So this is a good indication of uh, just the accuracy of the, him, uh, the homing pigeon uh, method. So it can get within a kilometer or so of its loft without being able to see it. So whatever it is out there that it's using, that's the accuracy. Um, and finally, what I'm gonna talk about is infrasonic signals. And Raviv has already talked about um, how far they're far traveled in the atmosphere, and since birds and pigeons are far traveled, right off there's sort of, uh, it's making a little bit of sense. So uh, I'll just talk very quickly about infrasound. Um, two points, the absorption of sound in the atmosphere increases with frequency. It's actually the square of the frequency, but here are a couple examples. At sea level, at sea level, 90% of a thousand hertz tone, which is cycles per second, is absorbed by seven kilometers. Audible sound to us usually doesn't go farther than about 10 kilometers. For a one hertz tone, uh, it would be 3,000 kilometers, and for a point. 01 hertz tone, it would be greater than 40,000 kilometers, and that's greater than the circumference of the Earth. Um, but there's another thing that happens. As the uh, wavelengths get longer, I'm sorry, as the frequencies get lower, the wavelengths get longer. And since the speed of sound is 340 meters per second, um, at one hertz, the wavelength will be 340 meters. At 0.2 hertz, it would be about 2 kilometers, 1.7 kilometers. At 0.01 hertz, it would be about 3.4 kilometers. Uh, I've noted here that uh, 1.7 kilometers, 0.2 hertz, is the peak microseism frequency. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, that is what I think the pigeons are using. Um, 
If you're a physicist, you're going to go, wait a minute. You're telling me that a pigeon that only has a bioral separation of two centimeters can localize a sound source that's coming 1.7 kilometers. It's impossible. Well, it is impossible if you're standing still. But if you move around, you can figure out where that source is by using Doppler shifts. And that's exactly what pigeons appear to be doing. When you release them from a release site, up here, they start circling. And this bird, within one circling, already knows what direction it wants to go home. So if you're moving toward the source, the frequency goes up. If you're moving away from the source, the frequency goes down. It's just the same thing when you hear a siren go by, you hear that um, It's only this time the source is stationary and you're moving. It's exactly the same. So they can tell direction by circling around and when they're going toward and away from a source. You can see here there's a little bit more looping around. I think what they're doing is trying to test wind drift there. They're looking at the ground and seeing how they're being pushed by the wind because that's another important thing. If you're flying somewhere, you want to know how much is the wind pushing you off course. A um, little bit of math here, but this is only to show you that Doppler shifting also depends on velocity. So you have to keep your velocity either constant or you, you need to know if you're speeding up or slowing down. So uh, one other thing I'd like to talk about is how infrasound moves in the atmosphere. This is a cross-section of the atmosphere, and it uh, goes up to over 100 kilometers high. You have the troposphere up to 10 kilometers, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. And the blue line here indicates the temperature. The temperature drops as you go up in the troposphere, it increases as you go up in the stratosphere, it drops again in the mesosphere, and it decreases again in the thermosphere. Temperature is what, devi temperature is what defines the layers of the atmosphere. Well, the other curve here is the speed of sound. And you can see, obviously, the speed of sound depends on uh, the temperature. So that's one of the major factors in how sound moves. And this is actually how sound moves. These are rays, and I want to show you briefly. how that works. So if you have a sound source, which is in the, the lower left corner, and what basically if you have the wave front of a sound, you know, if it's coming into the beach, you see the wave front, and so anyhow, I'm going to use this rod as the wave front. The ray is the line perpendicular. So it's just a simple way of pointing which way the wave front is going. So it, it actually simplifies the, uh, the, the plot. And what happens if you're in the troposphere and you have a horizontal wavefront, it's going to be, as you can see, warmer at the bottom and colder at the top. Well, since the sound speed depends on it, this is going to go slower and this is going to go faster. So it's going to do that. And that's what happens. And then if it gets up into the stratosphere, you can see the temperature profile changes the other way. All of a sudden, it's hotter up here and colder down here. It's going to come back down. So. So that's what this, is, this diagram is showing, and uh, Raviv mentioned this. So you get a stratospheric channeling of sound uh, because of, of its, it's called a refraction, reflection from the stratosphere, but it's actually a refraction. So uh, things that go straight up keep going straight up, and uh, you can see that here, this is only being launched at a nine degree angle. That's the ray is at nine degrees. So this is nearly vertical ray. And it's still going to be caught in that temperature profile and moved up. And what's very important is, here's where the, so here's where the sound goes up and comes back down. In between that is called the classical zone of silence. Okay, And I can show you that was seen very early on when you have a very large explosion. And this happened in 1921 in Germany. And uh, you get... All these black dots are where it's heard, white dots where it wasn't heard. And so you get this zone of white dots. And then beyond it, amazingly enough, people hear it again. And that's simply, this is the zone of silence. 
So it is in here. The sound has gone up and back down, and that's what's happening when you see it here. So now I want to talk about what bird. Now that I've done the tutorial, I'll tell you about、uh, what the birds have actually、uh, done. And、uh, I was an undergraduate at Cornell University, and there was a professor there. I was in the geology department, and a professor there named Bill Keaton came to the geology department, and he gave a lecture on his his research in bird navigation, and he was studying pigeons, of course, and he had been releasing pigeons all around upstate New York. Here's New York State, and this is the area. This is the Finger Lake region. So there are these very long lakes. And he talked about a number of locations where he had released a lot of birds, and he didn't understand what was going on. And in particular, he was talking about this place, Jersey, Jersey Hill, about 120 kilometers west of Ithaca, where the birds departed in completely random directions. They were lost. They were not getting the signal that they should be getting to return home. He was completely baffled. There's no magnetic anomaly, no gravity anomaly. There's nothing wrong with this hill. It's just a normal hill in、uh, upstate New York.、Uh, another site that he was confused by was Dryden, which was just 13 kilometers east. The birds would head to the northwest. They wouldn't head home.、Uh, about 75 kilometers north at Weedsport, they were headed pretty close to home, but they were always to the right,、uh, to the west. They would always head a bit clockwise off the direction. Could not explain it. He came to the geology department. Do you guys have any idea? At that time, I didn't. Unfortunately, now I do. I wish I could tell him. He unfortunately died prematurely. But when he died, all of his data was put online for anyone to use. So I've been using it. So it's a funny way that things come back around. But I'd like to show you the data from、uh, starting with Jersey Hill. This is the random data. What this plot represents. Is each of these dots represents a pigeon? Jersey Hill would be in the middle, here, and this is the direction back to the loft, the dash green line, for between 1968 and 87, almost 20 years. He released this is 984 birds, and nothing has been done to them. They're the control birds; they're just normal birds, and you can see they just head off in completely random directions. This is one individual release day. You can see that the birds are scattered all around. This arrow in the middle points to the average direction that they're headed, and the length of the arrow indicates how well they're oriented. So, if they are perfectly oriented, it, the arrow would go all the way out to the edge of the circle. If they're purely random, it would be basically zero length. You can see you just have the arrowhead here, so it's very random.、Um, so, again, they're random. But the other strange thing that Bill pointed out: if you take birds to that location from other lofts around upstate New York, not Ithaca, but other towns and places to the west, to the north, to the south, they fly home just fine, no problem. It's only Cornell birds are completely lost over this very long period of time, consistently. And the other thing is, only 10% of them ever came back. So you lose 90% of them. It's like the bird, bird muta triangle of New York. It's just birds fly in, they don't fly out.、Um, the other thing is,、uh, one day, August 13th, 1969, Bill took the birds there. They flew off in a very tightly grouped direction. They all flew home. He was absolutely amazed. He ran back the next day. They were lost. Uh, actually, I gave this talk in Santa Cruz, in California, and someone said, "August 13, 69—isn't that Woodstock?"、Uh, I had to look it up.、Um, no, it started on the 15th. So this is not due to the age of Aquarius. Okay. So now, what I want to show you is some actual modeling, modeling, numerical modeling, and what I'm going to show you is.、Um, Whoops! I want to start with this one.、Um, what I'm showing you, this is calculating rays. Again, I'm going to launch them from here, and this point is the loft. I'm going to pick the loft. Just go with me for now.、Uh, out here at 120 kilometers is Jersey Hill.、Uh, the horizontal line here at the bottom is sea level, and up here at 120 is the top of the atmosphere. And this launches rays, and you, this is basically a computer program. 
And what I've done is I've entered the real weather data for that day, taken from weather balloons, so I know the temperature profile, I know how the wind changes as it goes up, what the direction is, what the speed is, and those are the things you need to know to calculate how the sound is going to go. And it starts launching a ray at zero, then it steps up a degree, launches another ray, steps up a degree, it goes all the way up to 90. So it's showing throughout the whole atmosphere how sound from a source sitting at the Cornell loft is going to behave headed in this, I'm, sh I'm shooting it in a direction, and this is the direction, 265 is the direction from Cornell loft to the Jersey Hill site. And as you see, it's in the zone of silence. The majority, the large majority of days that birds were released at Jersey Hill, this is what the sound would have done. However, and you can see this, this date is shown, here's the actual data of the pigeons being released. They're scattered all over the place. Um, here's another day. This is September 10th. Again, they're scattered around. But this time, you form what's called an ephemeral duct. There's either a temperature inversion, uh, probably at about this level, or a wind shear. And wind will do the same thing. If you have the if you have the wave front moving and you have a wind that's stronger up here than down here, it'll cause the sound to go down. If the sound is moving toward the wind that is stronger, this will slow down, the sound will go up. So here you have a wind shear that's pushing the sound down to the ground, so wait a minute, that's going to go to Jersey Hill, so the bird should hear something. What's missing from this diagram, however, is topography. If you put topography in, when this sound hits down, it's going across this very, um, these, this is a vertical, this isn't the Himalaya, this is actually a vertical exaggeration. So here's Lake Cayuga, here's Seneca Lake. But this sound is going to go down, hit these slopes, and bounce up, and then the temperature structure is going to take it up. So it's never going to make it to Jersey Hill. Okay, so Jersey Hill is sitting in a sound shadow both because of the atmospheric structure of temperature and wind, but also because of the topography. And this, you know, this, this north-south grain of these lakes and everything are causing, when you go north-south, it's uh, making it difficult. So what about August 13th, 1969, the day they flew home? Well, if you model that, the sound leaves, and now I'm shooting it directly, 265, right at Jersey Hill, it doesn't make it there, but the birds don't fly directly home. If I shift the azimuth more to the south, to 245, that, thing's, that makes it even worse, and the sound is just refracted up. Nothing happens, but if I shift it to the north, there again, this is different. There is either a wind shear or a temperature inversion at, uh, oh, about a kilometer and a half up in the atmosphere that day. Whoops and it knocks it right back down. And that landing would be to the northeast, and due to Huygens' principle, that point where the sound hits the ground is going to actually behave like a source. So the birds are actually headed to the northeast, and I believe where the sound from the loft is actually hitting the ground. So they went home that day, because they could actually hear their loft. Um, the next day, back to being refracted up, no sound making it to Jersey Hill. Fits, fits the observations. I told you about Weedsport, and now you can be begin to see what's going on. <clears throat> uh, at Weedsport, the birds are headed again, sort of clockwise of the homeward direction, but the sound from the loft area hitting these hills will be bounced up, but going up Lake Cayuga and diffracting around this uh, terrain, it will arrive at Wheatsport from the direction that the birds are actually heading. Uh, same thing with Dryden. It sits in a little valley. So the, the sound is basically being channeled, diffracting around, and so the birds are actually acoustically thinking their loft is in this direction to the northwest because they're hearing the sound come from that direction. Okay, so the question is, let me go back. I'm talking again and again about sound coming from the loft. What do I mean? How is the loft? I mean, is the loft building <laughs> you know, emanating something? No. I'm talking about the ground around the loft. So you're thinking, well, wait a minute. The ground is making noise? 
Yes. Has it ever been measured making noise? Yes. It makes noise during earthquakes. And what I'm going to show you, this is an early study. Uh, in 1964, there was a huge earthquake in North America near Anchorage, Alaska, uh, a 9.2 on the Richter scale. And emanating, here's the, uh, this yellow triangle is the epicenter. This is the source. Um, if you were standing there, you'd be knocked down. But anyhow, the surface waves that were coming off that earthquake radiate out like a pebble dropped in a pond, these circular waves moving out in all directions. The rays would be like a spokes on a wheel. But anyhow, they're moving down this direction and this direction, and all of a sudden, these sources, uh, the triangles are sources that were picked up on an infrasound array in Boulder. The red circles were picked up on an infrasound array in Boston. And the green, tri the green squares were picked up on an infrasound array in Washington. You will notice that there are no squares, circles, or any sort of sources anywhere but in the Rocky Mountains. And the reason is, is if you're shaking the ground, if it's flat, it's just going to radiate the sound straight up. But if you have a mountain and you start shaking it, the steep side will start radiating the sound horizontal. So these spots are places of steep-sided terrain that are radiating the sound eastward that is being picked up by these arrays. And you can see the time increases as the surface waves move down the Rocky Mountains. So our crude infrasonic arrays can pick it up when you're having very large movements of the ground surface caused by an earthquake. Now these uh, probably movements, once you get uh, away, far enough away, say once you get sort of out of Alaska into Canada, humans aren't going to feel this. This is only like little millimeter type movements. Um, so, but are birds navigating only when there are earthquakes? No. So is the ground moving all the time? Yes. And where is that energy coming from? Well, Raviv talked about that. It's coming from the ocean. And Raviv was talking about microbaroms. That's when you have standing waves in the deep ocean, and you need two wave trains coming together. It's like plucking a guitar string. The wave goes out, hits the end of the string, comes back, and it sets up a standing wave. And standing wave means standing. It stays in the same place. It's not a traveling wave. The wave is actually going up and down in the same place. So uh, how do you get these two waves? Well, you need maybe a couple storms. Here you have different storm centers. And each is generating one, and they're coming together, creating these standing waves. Another great way to do it is to be near a shoreline and have it the waves come out of the storm center and then be reflected off the shore, and so the same waves are being reflected back on themselves, just like a guitar string, and you're getting the standing waves. Well, standing waves are going to be creating the microbaroms in the atmosphere, which is the background noise of the atmosphere, which Raviv said you can hear that anywhere on Earth. If we had a microphone right here, we'd hear the roar of it. But they also go all the way through the ocean column to the sea floor, and the pressure changes on the sea floor from these waves are creating seismic waves, which are called microseisms. Okay? And microseisms travel through the Earth and come up to the surface <coughs> and move the surface up and down a very slight amount. The waves in the ocean, however, are very large. Here, they're up to 10 meters in displacement. So these things are really kicking up a huge amount of sound. Once they get, come to the Earth's surface, it's very slight. But just to show you what distances this works on, here on January 17, 1998, in Wyoming, this seismic array is hearing microseisms from this storm. This seismic array in LA is hearing microseisms coming out of this rather small storm center. But there was a huge storm off of Nova Scotia just a few days later, about a week later, and both of these seismic arrays were picking up the microseisms coming off that storm. And here's the average displacement of North America of the ground. Remember, the microseismic is 0.2 hertz, six second period. So if I do it with my hand, it's 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, six. That's one cycle. That doesn't look like a tuning fork. It doesn't look like a guitar string or a violin string, which would be 
going crazy, it's very slow, but you can almost see that's like water moving. A water wave would move like that. So this is what it's creating in North America. And these displacements run from zero, of course, up to about four microns. Microns. That's a millionth of a meter. So, uh, but if you do a calculation, about a square kilometer going up and down one micron will create about 125 uh, decibels, if it's all concentrated, if you take all of it from that, uh, that, that area. So we're going up and down right now. We're probably, since we're near the ocean, uh, we're probably going up and down two or three microns every six seconds. Well, we're not going to feel it. But here's upstate New York again. This is a shaded relief map. And uh, the source, the light source is from the north. So all of these white areas throughout this whole thing are basically coplanar and pointed north. So if they're all moving, they're all radiating sound to the north. And in your imagination, I'm sure you can see, if I move the light source around to the east, it would look completely different, but they'd all be lined up going to, you know, north-south. If I do it from the south again, they would sort of be lined up east-west again, but they'd sort of be on the other side of the ridge from these, and so forth. When you train a racing pigeon, you have to train it in all directions, so it learns what its loft area, in my view, sounds like from each direction. It's like your house. You, front of your house looks like one thing, the back of your house looks like another thing, and the sides look like something else. So anyhow, but you have to have enough area that's generating a large enough sound that the bird can hear. And the farther the bird away, goes away from its loft, the larger area it probably listens to um, generating the sound. And as it gets closer, that area shrinks down until it's about a kilometer across, or two kilometers across. As we saw when you covered their eyes, they could get within about a kilometer of their loft. So to recap, uh, they, both birds and infrasound travel for hundreds of kilometers, thousands of kilometers in some cases, in the atmosphere. Pigeons de determine their homeward bearing using Doppler, sh Doppler shifts. The temperature structure and wind structure can cause shadow zones where birds are disoriented. Microseisms from ocean waves cause ground oscillations, which create atmospheric sounds. And I believe that pigeons can acoustically identify their home area the same way we look at it. And this is similar. Bats actually use ultrasound, very high frequency, short wavelength sound to image small insects. I believe birds are using very long frequency sound to image the Earth. And so this hypothesis explains some things that have not been explained that are in the biological literature. If you look at pigeons, uh, here's their homing performance. How well are they grouped? How fast do they get home? Versus the months of the year. Uh, inexperienced birds are always worse, so they're down low than experienced birds. But you see there's a, sh there's a this sine wave. It's, they, get, they do worse in the winter and better in the summer. Why? Because the atmosphere in the winter is much noisier because of all the storms in the oceans. They also don't like to fly over lakes. If you release pigeons on one side of lakes where their home is, they'll fly directly home. And if you release them on the other side, they will fly around the lake to go home. If you put them out in the middle of the lake, they'll just split into two groups and fly uh, to the nearest shore. Why? Because the lake surface, like the ocean surface, is generating microbaroms. It's jamming their homeward signal, so they want to get off that lake as quickly as possible, or not go over it in the first place. Uh, here's another very interesting experiment. A uh, Swiss guy named Gerhard Wagner released birds up above a temperature inversion on top of a hill. If they stayed above the temperature inversion, they never made it home. If they went below it, they went right home. Why? Because the temperature inversion will trap the sound underneath it, so the ones above will never hear where their loft is. And finally, uh, this is some work I did very early on. The sonic boom the shock wave off the Concorde will disrupt pigeon races. This is the uh, centenary race of the Royal Pigeon Racing Association. 60,000 birds, they didn't come home. <laughs> that was a big problem. The Queen's birds were out there with them. So what happened? Well, the plane, the Sonic, the, the SST leaving Paris, 
goes subsonic until it hits the coast, and then supersonic, and it puts out one heck of a boom of infrasound. The N wave, the overpressure, underpressure wave uh, that uh, Raviv was talking about. These birds, uh, one of them ended up in South Africa. Why? <laughs> it landed on a boat. Once it hit, <laughs> once it hit the uh, sonic you know, boom, it decided to land. The nearest thing was a boat. It was going for South Africa. Anyhow, um, so I hope that uh, you'll think differently about birds. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>